What is up, y'all? It's your boy Aniki coming at you with another video, My Hero Academia 344. So if you haven't already read it, get out the door. You already know we go with the page by page breakdown. So let's get into it. So right off the bat, we're starting off with a flashback. You can always tell when we're starting with the flashback is anytime Horikoshi opens up with a flashback, you got the black bars, traditional Japanese manga paneling. So we open with when we're finally getting the breakdown of what the plan is when they really finally start talking about what they're going to do and one of the main things here is that they're like we know all for one and they even specify this is back in the dorms during chapter two 342 which i kind of like the fact that he's like no specifically during this chapter that you guys read this is what happened i just didn't tell you all of it uh we, we find out you know they're talking about like we can't find them the search is fruitless and they're all like, oh, damn, this is pointless. And one of the things that I like uh, about this is that Bakugo had told them running around and trying to just find all for one like that wasn't going to be a viable strategy. One of the things that I like about this is that they were like, this is a racist plan. We have to and we have to like kind of like function as bait. So basically what happened is instead of just using Deku as bait, like the pro heroes had talked about during the uh, Deku Far From Home section of the story, we transition into we'll use class a and in general multiple heroes as bait which is kind of messed up but whatever we're just gonna have to go past that one i guess but in order to because it's, it's all about baiting and like they know that they have the search quirk and if you think back to uh the start of chapter 353 the search quirk is what let them know for sure as far as they were concerned that deku was alone so it's basically that once they got into agreed upon area they set it up so that realistically awful one should think Deku was alone and then people who hadn't been seen by Ragdoll for example or if he hadn't laid eyes on wouldn't be uh, popping up which is why when all for one is on the phone with Aoyama assuming that he can actually see in that area that he's like you know where they're gonna be setting up even if Shinso was close by it doesn't matter because all for one and Ragdoll have never like laid eyes directly upon Shinso and therefore the search quirk would not flag Shinso just hiding in a building it would just kind of let it go so any hero that didn't get encountered by those people doesn't have their data stored in search so that's one of the ways that we're getting around this so and they, they kind of talk about different ways to get around it or how they think about them but one of the main things that they're excited about is of course Aoyama being a part of the plan potentially and being reincorporated and how if they make it seem like they've been defeated or that they've fallen for the bait, it will finally give all for one the confidence necessary to step forward. Now, one of the things that I also want to talk about is that Mina is again on the verge of tears. I cannot emphasize this enough. Mina was not a crybaby before the war. And I don't mean to call her a crybaby in a disrespectful way. I just mean to say that Mina did not cry as much as she does now before she lost Midnight. I know some people want there to be that direct saying it, but like watching somebody who is a source of positivity, who is full of happiness, who is around and it was a linchpin even as a child back in middle school, you know, with groups being able to bring peace to people and stop bullies, being reduced to constantly crying and the constant anxiety and fears of losing others is massive. Nina is very much functioning as like kind of like a representative of Class A's grief and mourning over the situation with Midnight, and I can kind of really appreciate that. Um, and of course, we get Momo coming into the fold here. One of the things that I like about this is that one of the things I talked about on stream is that Momo is, for all intents and purposes, the ultimate handyman. She is always supposed to be using different uh, items, materials, constantly having to be resourceful, create different objects. And a lot of this chapter is about paying off joint training, even last chapter, I would say as well where you have Momo who is somebody who, because she has to think about all these different tools that she could potentially make at any given time, she also has to consider the possibility of what other people's quirks can do as they kind of function as stand-ins for other tools. So the best example of that, just real quick off the dome, is obviously Awase welding the tracker, making one that he could weld to the Nomu, keeping that in mind back during joint training when she made it a point to optimize towards uh, Tokoyami's physiology to make sure that the one who was their powerhouse and could utilize his quirk would be able to move around and have uh, eyes on the target so that he could hopefully defeat them. 
which if you think about it, he almost did. And then you think back to the situation with Maki, and again, where she was running point, she starts giving out orders because UA didn't train them to run away. Momo Yayorozu's leadership and training and knowledge constantly being like a central point to the strategies of Class 1A, and it's something that we've been wanting to see, and it's something that has been set up since the final exam arc and sports festival when she had developed these insecurities and finally working past them and even while being tired and exhausted not wavering that was the main skill that midnight really wanted for momo she had seen her have those confidence issues and you remember during joint training she really thought that momo would become a great leader and we finally get to see that payoff so it's like the commentary from midnight the emotions of mina we're seeing that the 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 story that the, that was written around midnight is still paying off there's still investment in what midnight has done for the story and i think that's beautiful and a good way to honor her death so to speak so we get these details that all for one only ever corresponds with the mama yama and papa yama through phone calls this is obviously because of the fact that all might punched his eyeballs away when you don't have proper eyeballs proper ears etc it's kind of hard to read text messages so in turn he always has to be on the phone this allows for him to listen to people and obviously he's utilizing that so that he can hear people and then that's where we come in with Shinso. We had talked about this last week. For those of you who have been in the reviews and you you, you know you watch this channel, we directly discussed Shinso having trained his quirk for several months, developing it and then being able to brainwash people and be able to make them talk. This was a pre-established thing because at the end of the day people need to remember back when deku was designing his costume we even talked about how people misunderstand their own quirks but you also have to think about it as quirks being like muscles like fibers they can grow more powerful we talked about the bakugo flight example look at ida who was able to be you know like as fast as a regular car and now you could argue that he's at least supersonic it seems or at least very very way faster than he was in the beginning of the series we consistently see people level up their powers and being able to use them in a unique way and of course like i mentioned previously brainwashing leveling up the obvious conclusion for that is for brainwash to level up and allow the person to maintain some form of sentience and eventually even possibly get into the point where you can basically turn people into sleep agent sleeper agents of your own free will uh under your will that would be the logical end step of uh shinso's quirk if he wanted to get that powerful where he would be able to give people commands and stuff have it integrate into their brain and they wouldn't even realize that it happened so and of course i just also want to point out that we did get an explanation for why shinso is allowed to use his quirk legally i know a lot of people find that kind of funny that we're still worried about the bureaucracy but the reality is is that that's a part of the story that my hero has built up and it would be stranger for horikoshi to make it a point to establish all these rules and then not have any follow-up or actually acknowledgement of it that's bad world building because if, if the world building and the details you place into the story about your world and the rules about your society don't impact the actual story then it's not actually meaningful world building and it's not actually worth having in the story at that point if it's not going to actually stick around and be consistent so props to them and if we can see that police and police chiefs and police stations and all this other stuff is still working even though they're all losing then it's obvious that the hero safety commission would still be functional we know that a bunch of them died we see that uh mira who's been here since provisional license exam is currently the president so just a lot of small details about the world around them so giving us that idea of that small chunk of hope that we can have for after the battle giving us something to look forward to so and of course shinso does comment on how he was supposed to join the course and didn't get to but he had been training his quirk so that's what's amazing or good about that so oh and then we get the reveal that shinso doesn't have a hero name yet but he is going to be developing one of course and we keep up um the train of tying in joint training and match five and specifically because we segue from the conversation with shinzo and forming that plan even though he doesn't have his traditional license and stuff and of course tokoyami does pose the question that can we even beat them but before we get but 
which is a whole topic that we could spend hours on if you really want to. We do on the Church of MHA. But with this, it's like the thing is the heroes don't need to be there in advance. Effectively, by controlling who is there on the battlefield, they should theoretically constantly be able to maintain numbers advantages. That's one of the upsides to this situation. By having Monoma copy Kurogiri's work, we have somebody who can consistently manipulate the circumstances surrounding um, the battlefield. Now, Aizawa asks, that tells Monoma straight up, Phantom Thief, are you up for doing this? And Vlad is like, you're going to be a key player and all this. And Monoma, I, what I like about this is that Monoma, like All for One, has been shown utilizing other people's quirks, like when he used uh, Kirishima's hardening, when he was using uh, the solid air bubbles and stuff like that. And But he acknowledges that certain quirks have higher skill floors than others. And so when he's like, you want me to master this complex teleportation quirk in a couple of days, this is kind of unrealistic. But to the same token, him stepping up and going forward going plus ultra this is kind of you know monomus plus ultra moment and it's wonderfully executed i'll say because he's talking to aizawa realizing that aizawa isn't going to be on the battlefield which means in theory we wouldn't be getting quirk erasure on the battlefield to shut down shigaraki shut down all for one which is a big thing that everybody wanted to see and ask questions about during kamino if we get monoma to get everybody where he needs them to be and then he himself is constantly teleporting back and forth between central hospital because i think that he has to make sure he maintains an uptime on the teleportation specifically or at least at the very least constantly sticking his hand back through the teleporter point to make to contact with kurugiri to refresh the timer because or even grabbing some of kurugiri's hair this is something that i also wanted to address while looking at this because with him utilizing uh Kurogiri's quirk like this I'm kind of hoping that and this is something that I've wondered about Monoma for a long time especially because we had it introduced with Mirio the concept of making costumes out of the person's hair or DNA could he tailor one of his phantom thief suits to have different hair fibers from various heroes so that he would have access to their power and be able to constantly switch basically having a free-for-all all-you-can-eat buffet yeah is it a little awkward sure the idea that he's wearing a hair suit of other people's but ultimately it one it would kind of make him the good all for one because he'd be running around wearing suits and utilizing quirks of different people but it would be with their consent which would also play into how he talks about how to be a hero he has to act like a villain and he talks about we get that flashback to you know him kind of pondering people talking about how he can't be a hero with his quirk and it's one meant for a supporting player and the thing about this and the, the encouragement that vlad gives him is that it not only plays into uh his own insecurities that we've seen throughout the series with class b being seen as inferior to 1a in his mind or like but it also circles back to again joint training when he says we are each to the last um bit play the main characters of our own lives and bit players and others basically talking about how ultimately yeah you're a main character for yourself but you don't necessarily matter to everybody else you're not as important which even that theme was brought up again with sue during deku far from home when they were trying to get deku to come back and telling him he doesn't need to live some comic book fantasy this idea that you're only the main character of your own life but you don't that doesn't make you it and so when vlad tells him no you are a star you are a center stage you are a main character it's it, the way to say that like you're not some supporting player s like supporting role player is snatching the limelight from the main character at the last second you are already your own main character and star remember your own words to a certain degree monoma live them and believe them because he can he was able to say all that stuff to encourage his own classmates but he was still struggling with his own feelings inside and so as we see the villains like pouring out obviously we know that if awful one steals one for all it's supposed to be the game changer game over blah 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 but uh that that's not that important we already know this is this but it is nice to see all might 
being aggressive, being excited, being excitable about this raid and like really trying his best. Now, one of the things I like about this is that we see Shigaraki touch the ground. And I've seen people say that they think this is Monoma using Erasure, which I don't agree with. I'm sorry, but I don't think that's correct. And the reason for that is, is that while, you know, Shinso improved his quirk and he was able to, you know, make people talk, I think that with Monoma, we've had it established that his primary form of improvement seems to be time limits and how long he can utilize other people's powers. And I would even argue maybe the number of quirks he can stockpile on him. Because he even asked, you know, back in the day, what if I can copy four quirks now? Stuff like that. And I'm going to be honest, if he was using a razor to shut off Shigaraki's quirk here, why on earth would he leave Dobby's active? I, I, I Just why does that make sense to you? why would he do that it, it they're right next to each other even so if last time i checked when like aizawa sensei would just look at the class if he's if all of them are in his sight their quirks just deactivate so if monoma was using a razor he would just be locking down all the villains because also then you don't need a strategy then then you don't have to separate them if he's using a razor while teleporting people he would just be able to lock down all the villains and then they would just load if them so that just narratively doesn't make sense. Now, can Monoma have a razor copied currently? 100%. 100% Monoma can have a razor copied right now. And that could really come into play later if he's teleporting around the battlefield, going to certain key fights, and then hitting them with the Aizawa treatment. And it's important to remember that the effects of his the quirks that he uses when he applies them stay even after he switches which quirk is active. So to a certain degree, it's arguable that it would be possible for Monoma to look at someone with Erasure and then swap quirks so that their quirk just stays shut down. I'm not guaranteeing that that happens because he talks about the changes in, but the, and the main changes that we were talking about in that example were size based and they were oriented around, uh, you know, like the lug nuts and stuff like that, staying big. But then you remember that Twin Impact also had that condition and he said fire you know all the way from back in the base where that seemed to already have a condition that all he had to do was say the word and it didn't matter whether or not he actually was still using it or not but i can't be sure if that was supposed to be what that scene was with twin impact but if that is then that opens up the door for him being able to erase quirks swap erase quirks swap erase quirks swap and not having to maintain continuous vision so and then, of course, everybody's excited because Dobby finally said Cree made it. Uh, it's worth noting that I have a copy of the Ultra Analysis data book and Dobby's quirk is still unnamed. So we can just keep hoping that it's cremation, but who knows for sure. Oh, and because I forgot to mention this, Shigaraki referring to Dobby as Dobby instead of Toya indicates that it is Shigaraki's personality that is more in control. And the thing that Shigaraki likely detected was the stuff under the under the ground all the pods and stuff that pop up later in the chapter to enclose them and this could be that he was thinking about trying to do a decay wave and opted out of it once he realized something was up because shigaraki himself may be looking for an opportunity to create some distance between him and all for one as well so that he can better submit and assert control just a possibility and as Dobby goes to throw his big attack, we see a bunch of ice come out, giving us that same feeling we got back during uh, MVA when it was Dobby versus Gaten. But what I also find funny about this is that it's the classic go-to Shoto Todoroki opening move of him using a bunch of ice. But this time, instead of it being something that people penalize him for or is used against him, it is actually advantageous for to do so. And so when we see all these other, all the 1A kids pulling up and Bakugo smiling and them all getting on there and Dobby pulling the familial tradition of yelling Shoto, you can tell that it's really about to go down. All Might is so excited that he's coughing up blood as he starts yelling for the operation to activate and the trap to go off. All for one comparing them to cockroaches and and basically calling them a nuisance is especially hilarious when you think about how this is the man that refuses to die who was effectively put a part of himself inside of another person's body just so he can stick around in a vicarious form uh 
And the thing about these cages is that obviously I'm assuming they're supposed to be high tech, decently resistant. And the reality is, is that if you're Dobby, if you're all for one, if you're Dobby, you can't just melt your way out of this necessarily unless you do a really pinpoint blast or you're just going to burn yourself alive. If you're all for one, you might not be able to make as big of an air cannon inside here. I'm not sure what it is, but him not being able to them not getting out is indicative of them not wanting to risk it because also if he just does that and then you damage all the villains on your side you now don't get to have those backup and you've made the fight harder for yourself so nobody's really trying the only person who's really willing to do that one big attack was dobby but most people aren't trying to do their giant aoe's yet and we've got monoma talking about how he's pulling the strings and they this is also kind of a callback to uh the ua the usj arc where you had the kurogiri come in and just split up everybody which ended up landing them in different spots now one of the things here is that the pod arrangement was semi-random so we don't know if with certain pods they're going to be very meticulous or at the very least they would have noticed the shigaraki pod or the dobby pod and then some of the other pods so we're hoping that when they talk about shoving them in and pushing those pods through the teleportation uh holes the warp holes that monoma makes that they're going to areas that it would be more optimal optimal for the heroes to fight them in instead of making the mistake that the villains made during usj by sending sue to the aquatic zone for example so all for one is marveling at how this is all done to split them up while seemingly not acknowledging that if all of those people were all in the same spot the all-out brawl would be disadvantageous for both sides but he doesn't actually care about most of the villains under him so you could argue that he doesn't mind losing a bunch of allies if it means winning but he claims that part of the reason why he resents all might so much is the destruction of all his allies though we know that it's just him being mad that he can't beat him so going forward I do have, obviously I've seen some people wonder if Monoma's going to be able to copy all for one, and if he copies all for one, would he be able to take all for one from all for one and then just go about his day, or would there be some kind of ramification for him bringing that into his body, would it, what, 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 would, the, what would that do to the conditions, there's all kinds of different ways that this could go left, um, but with Dobby being in his funeral garb like we talked about last week, and the, the amount of heroes we have on the battlefield, this is looking to be a really big war and we've talked about the past the clone conspiracy and how there could very well be some clones mixed in amongst this it's worth noting that i personally believe spinner is going to be one of the major keys to the fall of all for one and because of that the fact that spinner is not on screen this chapter and we don't see the heteromorph army should be a huge indicator that there is a, something going on in the background of the story that we aren't aware of yet and I'll be honest, when All For One decided that it didn't matter how they tricked him, I thought he was being cocky, I thought he was being reckless, and there's a certain precedent that establishes that oftentimes All For One will buck the plan to be petty for his ego. So because he wants to be able to show out here, then of course he's going to do that and be like, oh, yeah, screw it, I can beat all these people, I've got my army, this is going to be fine, it doesn't matter that they tricked me, instead of taking the time to think about the fact that he has been outsmarted, he is arguably potentially equally gunned, depending on how people choose to fight and what they do, and he's not really growing, and I think this is once again the payoff and something that was established back in Camino. He admitted himself that he wasn't ready to fight, wasn't planning to fight, but because he hates All Might so much, because he's such a hater, he has to, in his mind, take on All Might here and try to prove something to him and prove that he's, you know, better than him or whatever, and it's going to cost him terribly. All For One's plans have been fumbling for a while now, where he thought he had the upper hand just because he was able to be clever and get Deku to show up at the mansion in Hybori Woods and blow up one of the League's hideouts, but that's not what this is now. When he decided that he was going to punch All Might in the face because All Might punched off his face, we saw that there are cracks in that armor and that his ego is powerful. So that being his undoing is pretty fitting for a guy who's just too greedy 
at the end of the day, he's all for one. It's all for him. He wants to take it all in. He's trying to have everything. And because he's so greedy in this moment, he's greeting right now. And instead of taking that self-awareness and taking that moment to step back, he's going full force forward. And that's going to cost him because he's going to get out of that pod wherever he lands. And he's going to assume that he can beat them up. Or he's going to try to teleport somebody to him. There's a lot that can go into this because we don't... Because with... All for one of having the potential to constantly warp people to him, we can have an ever shifting battlefield because of Monoma and All for One bouncing around here and there. So that and it, there's a lot of variables in this still because of the amount of quirks and stuff that are just on the battlefield. So I'm looking forward to how we're gonna handle this, who's going where, who's fighting who, because obviously certain people are gonna want certain matchups more, and you have to ask yourself where Endeavor's gonna land because while Dobby wants to attack Endeavor. Endeavor's job is to take out the big guy. So Endeavor versus All for One could be a thing, but obviously narratively we, we see Endeavor versus Dobby as the most likely outcome because of the Shoto Endeavor thing. So I could easily see Dobby being someone who ends up closer to All for One as a means to make sure or Dobby ending up in the wrong warp gate and taking out some other allies and then being brought back to that main battle. Something that, but I'm seeing there has to be something that allows for Endeavor to still do his job as the number one hero while simultaneously creating that environment for him to fight Dobby and confront him and hopefully take him down with Shoto. Let me know what you guys have thought of this chapter of MHA and if you watch the Church of MHA then make sure if you haven't watched Church of MHA go see that because then you get my live reactions and the group discussion we had Volcon, Fish Mix, and we had uh, DPH or a Die By Paxer. So a couple of good real strong guests MHA heads uh, I appreciate everybody who came through and watched this video. Make sure to leave a like if you uh, enjoy the content. Make sure you subscribe. And if you really feel emboldened, you can even join. I'm Anaki. I hope to see you Sunday for the Church of MHA. And I am out.